OSHA. Rickon. Um, they're still on board. Why do you keep on just saying that? Why can't you give, ever just give me a yes or no answer? They're still on the board for a reason. He's not a serious politician. And so that frustration with his children really maps from the history of Why do you think, why do you take my anger as funny? My anger and annoyance. I'm giving you hope that they're still on the board for a reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's either actual truth or you're just, you know, giving me falsehood. I have always been your son. I think the comparison between Tyrion Lannister and Richard III is a, is a very good one. A 16th century historians describe Richard III, you know, as this uh, hunchbacked, evil looking character whose physical unpleasantness directly reflected his lack of moral character. Richard III has been vilified through history, especially in Shakespeare, as being monstrously deformed. And you could characterize Richard III as, quote unquote, a cripple. That's how a lot of people see Tyrion Lannister in the world of Westeros. But of course, as, as the viewer, we know that's not the whole story. It's Tyrion the Infant, House Lannister. He killed your father. He murdered the hand of the king. Oh, did I kill him too? I love Richard III. <laughs> He's uh, one of my favorite historical characters. He wasn't a hunchback. He didn't have a twisted arm. But because he was the king who was deposed by Henry VII, so the Tudor historians tried to make him a physically twisted, deceitful, kid-playing, child He was just mentioning the Tudors. Yeah, Remember, I was watching Tudors in there the one time, and Marge was in it. One of the actors that plays in that. The monster you think I am. Like I said, I think she got this role with Marjorie because of her role in Tudors. Twist his body into unfortunate shapes. This is a clear sign of the evil inside him. This was like how the medieval mindset worked. I did not kill Joffrey, but I wish that I had. Oh, yeah, that's sweet. No, I know. I think a really good historical comparison for Cersei is Margaret of Anjou, known as the She Wolf of France. One of the strongest females in the, the real life Wars of the Roses. Margaret of Anjou the strong queen of England in the 1450s wants to exert power like a man. I should have been more a man. I'd rather face a thousand swords than be shut up inside with this flock of frightened hens. She's willing to go to any lengths, politically or otherwise, to rule the country and protect her children's rights. You love your children. It's your one redeeming quality, that in your cheekbones. And your cheekbones. Joffrey is king. You are here to advise him. Only here to advise him. But you could also look at a load of the other women of the Wars of the Roses, you know, really strong women whose route to power and whose driving motivation is either gaining or preserving power for their sons. You're the hand of the king. No, uncle. Clearly it would not be appropriate for a woman to assume that role. I'm merely advising my son until he comes of age and chooses a hand for himself. There are so many women who are leading that was their sons idea. because their hus mm -hmm. husbands are either in captured or fleeing or, in fact, are just incompetent. A good king knows when to save his strength and when to destroy his enemies. So, in steps a very strong woman. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. I think that's the heart of Cersei. I think that really does draw on what we know real history from the 15th century. There are those that say your children were not fathered by King Robert, but they are bastards born of incest and adultery. A lie. A lie from the lips of Stannis Baratheon. I deny it. Good. Am I free to go? After your atonement. Is Cersei's walk of shame designed to humiliate her? It has real historical precedent for it. If we look at Jane Shaw, during the reign of Richard III, she was in a way scapegoated for a lot of the political problems that had gone before, and she was made to walk through the streets of London, uh, dressing her kirtle, which is more or less her underclothes, and holding a taper in front of her. In an age when women were modestly dressed and they wore veils, it was actually quite shocking to 
see someone dressed like that. It would have been quite humiliating. Cersei is naked when she performs her walk. Cersei? To us as viewers, it has almost the same impact as seeing Jane Shore in her kirtle would have had. It's almost an emotional translation of what it would have felt like. Really serious uh, public shaming and public penance. There's a huge amount of ritual purpose in that, which is to strip her of any um, majesty or uh, magnificence that she might have accrued in her career before that point. I see a huge amount of Joffrey Baratheon in Richard II, both of them boy kings, both of them not really learned in, in the ways of being a king, absolutely drunk on their own majesty. Right back to Lord Frey and command him to send Rob Stark's head. I'm going to serve it to Sansa at my wedding feast. A joke? Joffrey did not mean it. Yes, I did. Richard II became king because his father died before his grandfather died. I should have spent more time with you. Show me how to be a man. He's not been around his father. He's never been in military situations. They're coming ashore. Chicken. <laughs> They're too many. He's a brat. Kneel before your king. He's an MFSOB. <laughs> I said. I fight fear with sarcasm. I know you do. I fight fear with sarcasm. Some people <laughs> run. Some people are shocked. No, I mean, wait here. fear, I'd also be shocked. But if, <laughs> if I'm not shocked, I fight fear with sarcasm. <laughs> Always forgive um, your enemies. Nothing annoys them more. Kindness to your enemies is. Never let them die quite see suddenly. One day, as he was just eating lamb cray pie, and he choked to death. Uh, it's choking! Oh, 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 boy. Some people said it was poison. Other people said he was just died of apoplexy because he was so furious with his father for signing away the throne to somebody else. There are these incidents in history where people do die mysteriously, but Eustace is the only one I know who actually died choking at a feast, so that would probably be inspiration for the mode of Joffrey's death. Yeah, it's the purple one. I've always hated the bells. They ring for horror. A dead king, a city under siege. And then two seasons In later, well he hears the bells and runs. <laughs> I like foreshadowing like that. Because that was for Blackwater. Uh -huh. Really mashed up history is through its invention, its use of different types of weapons, different types of armor. You'll kiss it again when I return, and taste my uncle's blood. The Lannister armor uh, harks back to samurai armor, which I found fascinating, because the ability to take you know, Japanese feudal armor and splice it onto a story that's loosely in the English Middle Ages makes it really exotic, really exciting. I don't know that you could call it historically accurate, but I don't think that's the point. Well, the show's gotten a lot of arms and armor right. Uh, I don't know who's doing the arms and armor consulting, but it's it's really quite good. Well, uh, I love the swords Valerian and the fact steel. that there are some mm -hmm. that are a little more. I powerful wonder what than represents the Valerian steel. Oh, right. that would go with the fantasy uh, stuff because I mean there wasn't dragons and, and a great wall and white walkers during the War of the Roses. The idea of a sword that had a name. Valerian steel with special properties and very important part of yeah. medieval culture. Yeah, but I mean the wall might be based loosely of like. Okay. Okay. Keep there ha yeah, there have been walls. I think they even say something about in this video about the wall. But as in With, they compare it to another wall. Wouldn't they be the Mongol Empire? Well, yeah. Mongol Empire. Yeah. That was when the Mongol Empire. Wasn't it like the biggest empire? Like stretched all the way across? Yeah, size wise, I believe so. Yeah. Hey, episode one. Don't look away. Father will know if you do. I, Eggard, the House Stark, sentence you to die. Beheading for aristocrats um, yes, started me. really uh, as a decent way to get rid of an aristocrat. You'd rather be beheaded, go to theory, than be hanged. Kneel, my lord. And so it became, in the real Wars of the Roses, sort of the, uh, the 
go-to method of dispatching your enemies. Yes, we had to. Do it all over the place. The biggest crime is treason. Like the first three seasons, and then you get into the whole burning. Yeah. That is fake. Whoops. So long as I'm your king, treason shall never go unpunished. Like what's happening? So it. Like I see very. You see various government runs and very interesting uh, show. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the patriarch of the House of Stark. Meanwhile, Baelish is in the background, not doing anything. It's like the House of York, but if you look at Richard, Duke of York, the real historical patriarch, his career really doesn't map onto Ned's journey very well. And actually, there's another character who I think uh, is much more comparable with uh, Ned Stark, and that's William Lord Hastings. Now, Hastings was the great power of Edward IV, who I think unquestionably is Robert Baratheon. And they had this very close, chummy personal relationship. And we can all remember, you know, the early episodes of season one where we see uh, Robert Baratheon and Ned Stark enjoying that kind of fraternal relationship. Well, that's Hastings and Edward IV all over. And what's really interesting is Hastings helped Richard III to take the throne when Edward IV dies, but afterwards, Richard turned on him, and he was summarily beheaded. And I think there's a huh. lot of the career of Hastings that you can follow through the story of Ned Stark. You know, this loyal friend of the king who outlives the king, tries to do the right thing, and what's his reward? Head rolling in the dirt. Hiya, <laughs> uh, pigeons. We did the pigeons show. Hmm? The pigeons. Uh, I think that's just dramatic effect. All right, part two. Yeah, but I feel like that should be important for something. Mm -hmm. Oh, Rob. Rob. Another Rob. Robert. John. Game of Thrones. So you liking this so far? Well, I love yeah, it's very Thrones interesting. Homage to the Wars of the Roses is there are these deep, dirty, tactical struggles in which everyone's betraying everybody else, switching sides. George understands that war is not good and evil, red and white, one side and the other. He understands that war is Black real wars. You don't know when it started. You don't know when it's going to end. It was just an ambush. You can see the uh, Stannis people in the back running away in that shot. They're like, we're not front lines, we're getting the heck out. The, there's no possible way we can win. direct lift from the real life Wars of the Roses. It's got to be Robert Baratheon. You have this king so adept at what he does that he's able to grab the crown in Robert Baratheon's case from the Mad King, in Edward IV's case, from a mad king, who was Henry VI. But once he's got the crown, he has to face up to his own problems. Now, in, in the case of Robert Baratheon and Edward IV, those are pretty much personal, what we now call issues. Edward was a great warrior, but once the battles were over, he couldn't keep his breeches laced up, and drink and whoring were his downfall. Robert Baratheon was known for his drinking, his luxury, excessive eating, but also his success in battle. And these are all things that Edward IV is known for as well. There sits the only king I mean to bend my knee to. The king of the north! The king of the north! Imagine what would happen if everyone just agreed with There's each other. <laughs> yeah, not much. Everybody lives, though. Edward IV, treason. Your son under King's Landing to swear fealty to the new king. After Richard of York is killed, his teenage son Edward becomes the, the Duke of York and leads his armies and wins several victories over Lancasters while still a teenager and a very young man. Hmm. His grace summons me to King's Landing. I'll go to King's Landing. Call the bandits. They're not alone. Call the banners. Edward IV, or the future Edward IV, is still only 18 years old. Young guy. He's passionate, impulsive, Imagine 14 and a brilliant years old. military leader. He was never defeated on the field of battle. 
And Tywin Lannister's whole problem with Robb Stark is he keeps winning. Stark won't risk marching on Casterly Rock until he's at full force. He's a boy and he's never lost a battle. You'll risk anything at any time. And of course, like Rob, Edward married unwisely to a woman he met while on campaign. I don't want to marry the Frey girl. Hiya. The leader. Edward IV is Edward IV successfully overthrows Henry VI and becomes king, where Rob Stark gets Guys? killed <laughs> at the Red Wedding. The Red Wedding. To Bren. Man, it's the iconic Technical episode, air. right? It's almost too crazy to be true, except George has said he was taking his inspiration from real history. George R. R. Martin has taken several different events, specifically drawing from Scottish history, and mixed them up together to create the Red Wedding. Scottish history is uh, an amazing source of all of this, because it's one of the most incredibly bloody histories of any <laughs> country that I've ever, ever studied. He was looking at the Black Dinner of 1440, oh, held at the court of the boy king James II of Scotland. The Black Dinner occurred when the King of Scotland was having a, a dispute with the Black Douglases. The Lord of Douglas was a young man, 18 or 19 years old, kind of a Rob Stark figure, and uh, he brought his even younger brother with him, and they had a marvelous feast. And, Everybody was having a great old time. But then when the feast was over, a single drum began to play. Just boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's when she knew something was up. Well, what's happening here? <laughs> Men rushed in, grabbed the Earl and his brother, dragged him outside and beheaded them. Now the other half of it, of course, was the Glencoe Massacre, which was uh, a few centuries later. The Campbells came to the town of Glencoe, which was a McDonald town, and they, they stayed overnight with the McDonalds. But there were these laws of hospitality in Scotland that were very time-honored and obeyed, just as in Westeros. The McDonalds fed the Campbells, and they gave them water, and they gave them shelter from the storm. McDonald's. And then in the middle of the night, their guests rose up from their beds and started killing every McDonald they could get their hands on. You know, guests slaughtering their hosts. Hey. Case of the Red Wedding, I reverse that. The Lannisters and their regards. It's those two incidents I blended together to make the Red Wedding. Last time I saw Rob, he was in the courtyard of Winterfell. He was blessed to me at everything. I wanted to hate him, but I never could. Jon Snow, I think, is everyone's favorite hero of Game of Thrones. And we really root for him because of his really status and he's a bastard. A bastard boy with nothing to inherit, off to join the ancient order of the Night's Watch. In Westeros, Jon Snow finds his way in the world by becoming a soldier, by becoming a knightly character. Lord Snow here grew up in a castle spitting down on the likes of you. Do you think Ned Stark's bastard bleeds like the rest of us? Noble and royal bastards would be in similar situations in the Middle Ages. They were quite aware that they weren't at the same level or have the same status within the family as their brothers and sisters. The draw for a bastard like Jon Snow of, of going north to the wall and joining the Night's Watch is that it's an opportunity for him to make a career for himself. Welcome. Benjamin. A thousand foot of ice wall. Now that's a creative genius. We don't know of any ice walls like that. But we do have Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is 70 plus miles. And the Romans did it. Why? Because they didn't really want the Scots down with them. The wall was a defensive measure. It was, it was Hadrian people. drawing the boundaries of, of the empire and saying, on this side civilization, on that side wilderness, badness, savagery, and we'll, we want to keep See, it there. Like I'm the sure that the Scots I'd have to compare, compare it. tended to be compared to wildlings, but in the Middle Ages that was exactly how they were seen, certainly in England. When I came to write Ice and Fire, I knew I wanted to have a wall. But of course, you know, in my philosophy of turning it up to 11, I actually turned it up to, I think, at least 37 in this case, because <laughs> I made my wall 700 feet high and made of ice and magic, keeping out unimaginable evils beyond instead of just Scotsman. <laughs> but what we have in Westeros, of course, living 
patrolling the wall of the night watch. Sure. It's a place where all the brothers are equal, where your past doesn't matter. Can you pause it? Uh, where you can yeah. get on in life uh, by... Did he say that it was made from ice? It's 700 feet tall and made from ice yeah, and man. magic? Yeah, I remember the history and lore. I think they talk about it in the first history and lore. About how magic with using the giants back, you know, no, because they built it a thousand years ago. I know, but like, it said with magic. Like, it was, it's actually magic. Right. The wall's magic. Keep the White Walkers out. But in the history and lore, it only says that they somehow used a magic to bewitch the giants in order to build the wall. That's what the history and lore said. Oh. Well, I don't know everything. But. <laughs> they just said there was just magic said it was in magic the wall. magic in the wall. What? Well. <laughs> I don't know. Hey. Uh, what are we, eight minutes into this? we got about ten minutes, I think, left of this yeah. video. Each one, we're around yeah, 20 you can minutes. Continue. I can continue. How are you? I like this video too because you get to see a bunch of scenes from before. Monks of the Middle Ages. Hear my words and bear witness to my vow. Night gathers and now my watch begins. A lot of the stuff about the Night's Watch comes from the church militants of the Crusades, the Templars and the Hospitallers. They were sworn to poverty and obedience. They were sworn to chastity. I shall take no wife. Yes, that's in there. No denying that. I shall say no children. It's very specific. But what I found was I have to say about other activity. Activities. <laughs> <laughs> But they were also warriors. Yes, loopholes. <laughs> that is exactly what I do. I find loopholes <laughs> and <laughs> I try to make everything okay. Who initially began in the Highlands in Jerusalem. Uh, their great rival was Fathering no children. Were even more powerful. Not Who's number seven on that list? Well, they were sworn to protect Jerusalem. Never figured it out yet. No. Uh, so they Alice, they no tea and Alistair. Alistair. Alistair is no tea. Military border of essentially fighting. Common, the common mistake. Nice watch. But it's Alice, I sir. What I have left to give you. You can give me the north. Even if I wanted to, I'm a bastard. Snow. Kneel before me. Lay your sword at my feet. Pledge me your service, and you'll rise again as John Stark, Lord of Winterfell. John Snow just has <laughs> a better race to it. Sorry, kid. Yeah. Ask John Snow if it's <laughs> no Lord matter how old they are, I'm like, sorry, kid. Born outside, and it's king <laughs> led. Even if they're the like six years, years, years old, sorry, kid. Just what I say. Male heir is the most important person. So Rob Stark is the most important person in the Stark family. In the very first episode, you see the Stark children lining up to greet Robert Baratheon. Well, they're lined up in order of age and gender. So Rob Stark, who's the oldest boy, is first. Then Sansa is second. Arya is third. But she's late, and Bran is standing in her place, and she shoves him out of the way because she's the one that's supposed to be there. So in that, that very basic sense, we're talking about an aristocratic world in which your birth is, in a sense, your destiny. Yes, Westeros is a feudal system, although it's a feudal system, of course, complicated by White Walkers and Dragons. <laughs> I do yes, White Walkers and Dragons. <laughs> but I have a, a quasi-feudal system where there are landed knights and lords who have castles who swear fealty to the king. So there's this network of, of obligations. You have lower lords like Eddard Stark's vassals in the north. All those high lords, they all thought they were better than me. Ned Stark, Master Tully. People like Bruce Bolton, who kind of chafe a little that they have to bend the knee. No more Starks to bow and scrape to. Must have been torture following that stupid boy all over the country. He ignored my advice at every turn. That relationship of having to serve a lord, an overlord, militarily, as well as support them in other matters, was very common in the Middle Ages. I need you, Ned. I have a son, you have a daughter. 
about a thousand times. <laughs> yes, she's the one to marry off. Consider their marriages the way a corporate CEO might consider a merger. The young wolf has lost half his army. His days are numbered. Theon and Greyjoy murdered both his brothers. That makes Sansa Stark the heir to Winterfell. You will wed her better and put a child in her. Tyrion will do as he's bid. As will you. you. <laughs> that was a great scene. He will marry Sir Loras. The closing I scene of uh, Kiss by Fire. Secure the beach. No, I won't do it. Yes, you will. Individuals are in a large part defined and often struggling against what they've been born into. I can't marry him. You can't make me. He is a traitor, a murderer. You're not marrying Roose Bolt. No, you'll be marrying his son and heir, Ramsay. I will starve myself. I will die before I have to go there. I won't force you to do anything. When you look at the Wars of the Roses, there's one character, Elizabeth of York, who's sort of traded a little bit, exactly the, the, the same way that Sansa Stark is. So Elizabeth of York basically became a political pawn between uh, the different families all circling the real English crown. Please let me go home. I won't hey, do anything. Hey, Samaritan. Close your eyes. Says, I'm still to marry you, <laughs> so you'll stay here. It's funny. I obey. Arya stabs his eyes. Based on She's a black. Character. <laughs> but she may also just be an amalgamation of every single daughter of every single king of every single kingdom in the entire Middle Ages from the beginning to the end. Daughters were used as bargaining chips. I know how to play a man like Drogo. I give him a queen and he gives me an army. I don't want to be his queen. I want to go home. We go home. With an army, with Carl Drogo's army. You die in six episodes. <laughs> what are the historical influences? Um, yeah, they're finally the touching on this well, stuff. I think you can see a lot of the Mongols and the Dothraki, you know, in the 13th century when Genghis Khan and his successors were burning everywhere from Beijing to Baghdad. They also have a lot of the Huns in them who were a similar nomadic horse people who came out of Asia a thousand years earlier. The Huns? Like the Dothraki, spent all their time on horseback. They slept on horseback, they made love on horseback, they negotiated diplomatic treaties on horseback. Where's he going? The ceremony is over. Did he, but he didn't say anything. Did he like her? Trust me, Your Grace. If he didn't like her, we'd know. I think he said the nomadic, the warrior, perfectly. Whether it's a Mongol or a Hun or any of those guys that come off the central steps, they move as communities. Everybody is tied to the way of life. Women are every bit as, as wild as the men are. But I think there's also quite a bit of Native American uh, culture that's, that's feeding into the Dothraki. What we know of, uh, let's say, the Comanche tribe is you know, a very well-groomed culture. There was a great pride in the warrior's appearance. We know that the Dothraki grow their hair and their braids until they're defeated in battle and then cut them off. I think this real concern with the physical projection of the warrior spirit. There's a little bit of Native American there. But I took some elements that were purely fantasy to try to create something that was grounded in reality but was not necessarily just the Xerox of reality. She truly is a queen today. Daenerys Targaryen, what an amazing Maybe. character out Maybe. there over the water, and we're just waiting for her to arrive, right, with these dragons above her. Danny is perhaps the most intriguing character to try to match up historically. Joan of Arc, of course, is, is one that you want to compare Danny to. The problem, of course, is mm -hmm. she gets burned, and she doesn't come out of the flames with dragons. Danny, of course, does. Joan of Arc. If we are going to say that Westeros is a, a sort of mirror image of the Wars of the Roses, and there's one character that Danny looks very, very much like, uh, except it's not a woman. It's Henry Tudor, who spent a lot of his life in exile. Henry VII, who was known as Henry Tudor before he became King of England, spent most of his life hiding in France, kind of like Viserys and Daenerys when they're hiding with Illyrio. It won't be long now. Soon you will cross the narrow sea and take back your father's throne. Henry VII was 
hiding abroad to avoid being captured and killed. The whore is pregnant. You're speaking of murdering a child. I want her dead. Mother and child, both. Is that plain enough for you? But he came back to fulfill the prophecies, the ancient Welsh prophecies, and when he marched back to England, above his armies fluttered a flag with a dragon on it. Dragon? I don't think you can just say that Danny is Henry Tudor and that's that, because I think there's a lot of classical ancient history that's been put into that character as well. So there's a little bit of Alexander the Great, who was a king who conquered huge swathes of territory and took lots of different peoples along with him. I think there's a lot of Cleopatra in there as well. A very, very strong female uh, character who Cleopatra. is in some sense always struggling with the consequences and the obligations of power. I did not take up residence in this pyramid so I could watch the city Pyramid. below decline into chaos. We see in season five, Danny's living in a pyramid. Well, Cleopatra came from Egypt, and I don't want to be too flip about it, but I sense a lot of Cleopatra folded in with a, a big dog of Henry Tudor, with these dragons flying above her. A big part of Danny's story is her journey around Slaver's Bay and her kind of puzzling out her relationship with the slaves whom she, she gathered into her army. Some say the Unsullied are the greatest soldiers in the world. The greatest slave soldiers in the world. Slave soldiers, they go way back. And so the Unsullied can be matched up to the troops that the Spartans had. They can be matched up to the Mamluks, who were probably our most famous slave armies. One of the most successful uh, Islamic dynasties in the Crusades were slave armies, the Mamluks. And I think when we look at the Unsullied, I see a lot of uh, the Mamluks in there, as well as a bit of the Spartans, the people who've been selected purely for their fighting Spartans? ability. They may suit my needs. Tell me of their training. Well, the Unsullied are loosely based on some of the slave soldiers of history, the, the Mamluks of Egypt, the Janissaries of uh, the Turkish Empire similar groups who were children taken from their parents as slaves and trained solely for the purpose of being warriors. Slaves don't like being slaves and when a person like Danny comes in and offers them uh, freedom, almost everyone, especially the young ones, are going to want to get freedom to pursue their own interests. I don't expect the wise masters to be happy. Slavery made them rich. I ended slavery. They do not ask for the return of slavery. They ask for the reopening of the fighting pits. The fighting pits? Where slaves fought slaves to the death? Having humans slaughter each other for entertainment, so that's gone on for centuries. But I think, you know, if you were going to pick a time when it would be very popular, it's ancient Rome, isn't it? It's the Colosseum. Yep, so the didn't we relate it to that? Yep. And I think uh, hark directly back to ancient Rome. It was actually the Etruscans who, who uh, began gladiatorial games, and of course the Romans conquered the Etruscans, they picked up some of their habits, including that one. Those games, gladiatorial uh, matches, they're pretty fierce. It's a, it's a sport, but it's a, of course it's a blood sport. If you make a mistake, you die. <laughs> of Slaver's Bay, it's really reminiscent of um, what I always imagine ancient Egypt must have looked like. Very exotic, the people very different to the, the rest of the Mediterranean. Um, this really huge monumental architecture that just looms over everyone who approaches it. There's so much of Cleopatra and North Africa in the ancient world, all in that, that little area of Slaver's Bay. It's a, it's a really great counterpoint to the rest of, of Westeros. I think you could look at the Wars of the Roses and try and work out where George is going. I think you could do that. I think you'd also run the risk of going insane. Everything in the world is grist for the mill, be it, you know, real life or contemporary events or history. I mean, it, it, it's all stuff that you can take and rework and make into stories. Whatever happens in the end in Westeros, maybe it will map the Wars of the Roses. Maybe we'll be sitting there going, oh, this was exactly what happened. 
Or maybe it'll just be whatever George wants it to be. It occurred to me that if I tweaked it just a little and I added some fantasy elements and changed characters, then now you have all the appeal of the Wars of the Roses, but you also have unpredictability. You don't know who's going to win. You don't know who's going to die. Yep, I think that's it. All right. Well, I was recording, Anna. Yeah. You were? Well, when I got the episode got done, I went up there to, to <laughs> I hit record. You were? I wanted a true reaction out of you without knowing that you were being recorded. That's why you were I on, was listening that's why you were on the I phone. Like, <laughs> I was listening. And I didn't even complain about you being on the phone. <laughs> But you had a good conversation because you weren't thinking about the, con <laughs> the camera being on. I didn't know the camera was on. And I was doing some <laughs> Snapchat. <laughs> Alright. Well, hey, that might be a bonus video. I don't know.